Uh, welcome everybody. It's uh, great to have such a good audience for this webinar, so thank you for your interest. Um, what Tom and I are hoping to do is, is to give encouragement without um, creating unrealistic expectations. Uh, so, um, starting off with a, a key decision um, which needs to be made before you start any breeding operation, and that's whether you're breeding for the flat or breeding for national hunt. Um, and there's also what we call dual purpose horses, which are essentially flat horses with the stamina and, and substance to allow them to do both jobs. Now, a lot of people I know come into breeding with, with pre-established preferences, so we won't spend too long on it. But in, in general terms, the most significant difference is, is probably in time scales. Uh, so if you're breeding for the flat, um, there is a premium on, on maximizing potential to, to race as two-year-olds. So the rearing program tends to be pretty intensive, trying to get horses to mature and develop as quickly as possible. The main point of sale from breeding to racing is as yearlings um, in the autumn of their second year. Um, but breeders have the option to sell as foals when, when they'll be selling to people who will, will rear them on, um, people we refer to as pin hookers. And on the flat, the tendency is for the horses to have short racing careers, probably two or three years. We have a lot of financial incentive to um, retire them to stud. Now, National Hunt is, is quite different. The, the rearing programme can be less intense. Um, the horses need longer to mature um, and the colts will, will normally be gelded to make it less stressful um, taking them through that, that rearing process. Uh, the, the main point of sale from breeding to racing is as three-year-olds, although again, um, breeders can sell as, as foals or yearlings or two-year-olds to, to pin hookers. And, the horses will tend to have much longer racing careers, um, often not showing their best form until the, they're maybe seven or eight years old or, or even later, um, by, by which time your flat horse will have retired to stud and, and should have its first runners on the course, just to sort of uh, underline the, the, the difference. Um, another option to consider before you start is really if your primary aim is going to be to, to breed to race, which we'd refer to as an owner breeder, um, or to breed to sell, which we'd refer to as a commercial breeder. Tom, Tom is there anything you want to add on, on the sort of difference between National Hunt and Flat before we move on to the differences? Uh, no, I think, um, uh, and first of all, hi everybody, thanks for joining. It's great to see so many people um, with us today, it's brilliant. Um, I think you cover the National Hunt and Flat very well, Joe. Um, for the difference between owner breeders and commercial breeders, for me, the biggest choices you have are the stallions you choose to breed to. Breeding commercially, you're, you're limiting your choice of stallions to sort of horses that uh, you might think would sell well at the sale or, or, or might be attractive to, to certain parts of the world. And you're not quite so much thinking about how those stallions pedigrees relate to your mare's pedigrees. If you're breeding as an owner breeder, you have far more choice. You can be selective. You don't have to worry about fashion. Um, it's a much longer term, term process, but um, that's the main difference. Um, there's obviously, if you're breeding to, uh, to, to, to race, your, your yearlings are under a little bit less pressure. So for example, now we've got about 30, at Barton Stub, we've got about 30 yearlings in prep at the moment, ready to go to the sales at Tattersall's or wherever. Um, and we've got about 15 that are being kept by different clients for, 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 to race. They're still out living a normal life. So they have to have a longer summer. They're under slightly less pressure. So those are, those are quite big differences. Um, the other thing to consider as an owner breeder is that you always can sell out of training. And actually the market for out of selling out of training in this country is very strong. So you're not completely limiting yourself. You know, if you keep your colts, you can sell them to America, Australia, whatever, Hong Kong, if you have a good one. Um, so uh, there, there are lots of options, but for me, those are the, sort of the main differences between, between breeding to race and breeding to breeding commercially. And Tom, before we move on to the, the costs of breeding, perhaps worth mentioning for the owner breeder, there are pretty significant costs of putting a horse into training. And, and I'd suggest budgeting sure. sort of probably 25 to 30,000 pounds to have a horse in training um 
we, we don't want to tread on the toes of, of the Racehorse Owners Association, but perhaps just briefly mentioning that, that you can mitigate those costs by sort of syndicating or, or leasing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, for me, look at Australia and those parts of the world, it's brilliant. The, the more people involved in, in racing, the better. Uh, it's just as much fun owning horses with your friends. Uh, Training fees are incredibly expensive. You know, uh, racing yards and studs are, in, in, are very high on labour. They're incredibly expensive things to put on. You know, you're, you're right in the figures of 25, 30,000 a year. That's not including vet fees, which can often be 10,000 or more, sometimes more. Um, gallop fees, all that kind of thing. Um, for me, the way forward is syndication and, and, and trying to split horses up through as many people as possible. Um, it's just as much thrill owning a small amount of a horse that goes and wins as it is owning it yourself. And, and, you know, in many ways you can spread the cost and have a couple in training where you'd only be able to afford to have one if you owned it yourself. So, you know, definitely, definitely worth considering. Yeah. Which, which brings us on to the next topic, which is the costs of breeding and, and sort of top of my list, I put the mare purchase as, as being possibly the most obvious. Um, and you can go to the sales or you can do a private deal and, and, and you can buy a mare for as little as a thousand or, or you can spend as much as millions, five million plus. Um, and I think the point here is, is that part of the nature of the game is that spending a lot of money doesn't guarantee success and, and spending very little money doesn't guarantee failure. That there, There's a wonderful sort of uncertainty. Um, but it is so important to get that first element of, of the mare purchase right. And then once you've bought your mare, there's going to be costs of, of keeping her, which we'll, we'll come back to a little bit more detail later. Um, and then the next um, significant cost is, is buying a nomination, which is the term we use for the, the right to use the services of a stallion. Um, multiple ways to, to obtain nominations. You can go to the stallion manager and, and, and negotiate a deal or, or quite often you just have to pay um, the advertised fee. Um, all sorts of terms that are available. Normally um, the most common is, is probably what we call October the first terms which means that the owner gets the mare tested at the end of September and if she's not in foal um, the fee becomes non-payable. Um, another option and quite a few studs offer is, is live foal with, with a, a, a typical sort of specification that the foal stands and suckles, but there are variations um, and you can have combinations of the two. And, and it's far less common now, but there also used to be nominations that were sold what we call straight, which means you, you pay your fee and you take your chance, but we don't see very much of that um, nowadays. Also the option, which we're gonna to come to back back to later if we have time is is buying an interest in the stallion either a share or a breeding right which would normally um, entitle you to one or more nominations every year but we'll come back to that so again uh, carrying on with costs you've got the costs of registrations and to give you some idea um, registering a foal if you do it by July the 31st is just over 100 pounds um, online uh, change of ownership, which hopefully you'll only have to do once, um, is about £50 to under online. Um, and if you buy a filly out of training, you have to pay a fee to register her as a broodmare. So you can then register her progeny. Um, again, it, it's a, a once only payment and it's just under £100 online. And then the next cost centre on my list is insurance. Uh, probably important to mention third party liability as with owning uh, a, a dog or a cat, the owner has liability for any damage that that animal might do. So uh, it's sensible to have third party liability insurance. Uh, members of the TBA get, get an element of third party liability free, free with their membership. Um, and in many cases, you get a, a degree of, of cover through your household or your farm or, or your estate policy. It, it's not hugely expensive, but it is something that um, should be thought about and, and, and make, make sure it's in place should it be needed. Um, probably the most common form of insurance that the breeders would use is what we call all risk mortality, which is just an insurance against 
um, the, 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 the mare dying or, or the foal dying or the yearling dying. And that's going to cost you somewhere between sort of two and a half and three and a half percent. Um, and worth considering a thing called life-saving surgery cover, um, which means that if the mare gets a bout of colic or, or a really bad foaling and requires surgery, which can be very expensive to, to save her life, then, then some policies cover that. Um, always sensible to speak to a broker who specialises in the bloodstock market um, and, and they can advise. Uh, various other forms of, of insurance, certainly if you're going to the sales for the first time to, to buy a mare, I ought to just make people aware of what we call fall of hammer um, cover insurance, which uh, blanket insurance, which means that, that you can pre-arrange with a broker um, that you will have um, cover of, of your new purchase from the moment that the, the hammer falls, which is when ownership technically um, transfer, transfers. Uh, transport costs and sales costs obviously depends on how you run your operation, but, but to my mind, um, they, those are the, the, the main costs. Anything you want to add to that, Tom? Um, yeah, I mean, you covered most of them. For me, uh... From a, from a breeding side of it, there's two things that I always make sure uh, I, I concentrate on insurance. The first, the first, first of all, to say that everyone, insurance is a very personal thing. Some, you know, we have lots of clients, some people don't insure and they have vast sums of money invested. Other people insure everything and pay large premiums, but it's about finding where you're comfortable, insure what you, can aff you can't afford to lose. Um, a, a good idea if, uh, if you want to be on the safe side for me is to ensure if you say you had five mares ensure you know your nice one well and the other ones maybe for just the minimum amount say five thousand pounds which is a relatively small premium but it gets you the life-saving surgery so if you have a problem falling or you have whatever then um you've got that sixth whatever it is maybe eight thousand pounds cover for surgery which i just think for a relatively small premium is quite a clever way of um, covering yourself against massive costs um, on possibly less valuable mares. So that's one thing I'd recommend. The other thing I'd recommend, as you touched on, Joe, is um, after the fall of Hammer, if you buy a mare in foal, I would strongly recommend uh, having, a, having a good think about how much of that mare's value you've just bought is tied up in the pregnancy inside it. For example, if you buy a mare and fold a lope de vega for 150,000, stands for 100,000 euros or whatever he stands for. So, you know, you're actually at a huge risk. Once that hammer falls, if that mare aborts that pregnancy or there's a problem falling or the foal sadly dies after a, a week old, which, you know, which happens, um, you know, we're talking about livestock. Um, you know, you, you've got to be covered for those things because it's a, it's a, you can suddenly get left with a mare that you paid a lot of money for and actually have very, very little return for. And before you know it, you've got to put another nomination into her and suddenly you're, you're even more money down. So that would be a tip for me to think about. I know often people don't. Um, so, yeah, other than those two things, Joe, I think, I think, um, I think we covered it quite well. Brilliant. We want to just sort of try and go into a little bit more detail on the cost of keep. And, and I know a lot of breeders, their operation is, is done as a hobby and, and they don't seek a particular return for their own time or, or facilities, which allows them to have um, much less sort of expense on the, on, on the balance sheet as far as keeps are concerned. E equally, there are a lot of breeders who, who don't have the time, they recognise they don't have the time or they don't have the facilities or, or maybe they recognise they don't have the knowledge um, and they will pay for their mares to be boarded on other studs. I, I know that's the service that, that you offer at Barton. Tom, can you give us a bit of an idea of the costs? Yeah, of course. Um, the, I suppose the first thing to say is um, you know, it's it's if you do buy a mare, it's incredibly the most important thing is to look after that mare properly. Um, if you've got the facilities at home, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, if you do have the facilities at home already, you'll be aware that it's not exactly cheap to to own land and fence and have people help and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's why people use boarding studs like like the one that I run. Um, 
a rough idea of cost, I always think is about per mare, about £10,000 a year to budget, including vet work, including farrier work, including wormers. Uh, that's, I haven't actually worked that out exactly, but I think if you kind of use that as a block figure, um, it's quite helpful. Um, I think maybe breaking it down a little bit, vet work, uh, if your mare is straightforward and gets in full first time, you know, you could be looking at very, very small fees, a hundred pounds, a couple of hundred pounds. If, if it's, if, if she's being difficult and has to go, go to a stallion three or four times, then you, you know, things can rack up to north of 500 quid. Um, unlike training, having horses in training, it's not going to get completely silly unless you have a, a drama or an ill foal or something, which, which hopefully won't happen. Um, as far as, uh, so that's just mares, 10,000. So, Obviously, once your mare fold, we we wean foals at ten uh, at five months old, uh, and then they, the, when they're weaned, they become a separate entity, so they're charged separately. So if you are going to use a boarding stud, make sure you discuss about weanling charges and yearling charges and um, things like that. The other things to consider are sales preparation. The costs go up when your horse comes in for sales preparation. So for the yearlings that we're prepping at the moment, you know it's an incredibly intense process. Not intense on the horses, but intense on the the people working here. It's busy, um, you know. It's very hands-on. Each person has two yearlings to look after, and they're grooming them and hand walking them and lunging them and all that kind of stuff. So it's very staff-heavy. Um, so hence why the costs have to be passed passed on. Um, so talk about talk about those kind of costs. Um, I think I think if to be honest, if you're talking from if you're talking about the cost of a foal from the foal sale to a yearling sale so if you were a pin hooker or you went to buy a foal or whatever it probably costs you about seven or eight thousand to get from a foal sale to a to a to sold at a yearling sale um other costs to consider are folding fees always ask what the folding fee is um most boarding studs would have someone sitting up all night um, and have cover all day for, for mares folding which is you know it's really important and virtually impossible to do at home on your on your own, um, and you're bound to miss the, miss the mare. So I highly recommend using professional places for for, for, for foaling. Um, uh, other expenses are sales expenses and sales commissions when as and when you get to the sales. So sales expenses is a is a fee that we you know I would work out what it costs Barton Stud to be at the sales with all of our guys all the feed, everything, um, and we share that cost between the people, um, the people selling horses. So that can vary from £100 a day to £150 a day, depending on the sale, depending on how many days before the sale you need to be there to show. So book one, they've got to show for four or five days, um, whereas book three, they're only there for a day before. That's just about how Tattersalls have laid out their sales. So that's something to consider. And percentage, you know, nowadays it's highly competitive, Three and a half, three, four percent is 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 about where where most people are. So um, the days of five percent are gone, uh, sadly for us. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think Joe, that's that's the costs that I can think of. Have you got anything else that I've missed? No, that's great. I, I just remember something I missed, Tom, which is nomination costs, and, and mm. it's actually difficult to be too specific, but an absolute minimum would probably be a thousand maybe maybe possibly less national hunt um the, the maximum 250,000 <laughs> um nomination fees so you know that is quite a wide scope and, and obviously it's a, a key part to, to choosing an appropriate stallion is looking at the cost of the nomination but uh, yeah and uh, it, it's, but, it's weighing that up against your mare as well isn't it joe you know there's nothing worse as you know than over mating a mare um, because you, you know you end up paying vast nomination fees and then selling disappointingly, so choosing your nomination is vital, um, and knowing where you are value-wise. People always sort of overvalue their own stock, which is which is important not to do. Be realistic. Um, I, I think we're talking about breeding rights and shares later, are we, Joe, or are we touching on that now? Well, we, we can come back to it if we have time, yeah. Tom. I think it's probably okay. the, the important way to work. Um, the, the, the the final sort of piece on, on this slide, Tom, is talking about financial prospects. And, and certainly, you know, I'm very aware that the, the, the recent TBA economic impact study suggested that there are 
breeders who, who are finding it hard. Um, and I have enormous sympathy for them. In, in, in many cases, they're putting their hearts and souls into their breeding operation and, and not, not getting financially rewarded. Um, and I suspect the biggest problem is, is that if, if you can't afford to, to invest in, in the appropriate stock, then, then you're either very reliant on, on luck um, or, or it is going to be incredibly hard and, and, and it's all very well putting your heart and soul in but, but it's incredibly important to remember to use your head um, but, but, but that said Tom I know you know your experience is, is that there is profit to be made uh, yeah I, I think it is very difficult at the moment as you say Joe that I'm a positive person and I'm young in this industry and I'm conf I greatly believe in the industry and uh, believe that there is money to be made and careers to be had. Uh, we certainly have clients that do very well out of the industry. Um, it's at the end of the day, it's all about um, it's all about, as you say, using your head and making sensible decisions, getting the right advice, having your horses looked after at the right places. Um, you know, with the right things being done to them to maximise your opportunities of, 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 of you're purely breeding for commercially to maximise your, you know, D-Day, which is sales day. Um, that all comes into where you board and things and little things like that. But um, I'm a big believer it can be done. You're dead right. It's all about quality. Um, there's no point from breeding from any old mare or, or just a filly that you had in training that you liked. You know, she's got to she's got to have potential. Um, you can't expect people to buy stock that um, you know is either out of mares that have, were average or, or 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 don't look right. So you know you've got to be realistic. Um, but if you are all of those things, um, I'm a big believer that it can be done. The Irish do it a lot. Um, so yeah, no, I'm I'm very I'm not quite so negative as other people. I just you know it's not easy for someone that hasn't done it. But the, the key is to get a good team around you, be realistic, and um, you know at the end of the day, it's great fun, and there are there are there is money to be made. Great. So moving on to the next slide, and, and probably an absolute key part of this process, Tom is is talking about selecting a mare or, or deciding whether you're going to retain the filly that, that you've had in training. Um, what, what would you see as, as the most important factors in selection? Uh, well, for me, you know, it's, again, it's economies of scale, isn't it? Um, if uh, pedigree is very important, broodmare size is increasingly more important, or, you know, always has been, but for me is very important. Um, confirmation, is important depending on uh, depending on what angle if you're going to breed commercially or not if you know if you're going to breed commercially confirmation is very important um, if you're breeding to, to, to race or, or, or slightly more relaxed and you and you for example had a nice filly that was rated 90 just didn't get any black type and you're happy to, to race her progeny then yeah you know, it's a good idea to, to breed from her because you want to she was talented it's worth doing but if you've got a, you know, if your filly is small and incorrect and she just happens to be a, you know, a, a, a okay racehorse, then you've got to be realistic that it might, it might not work. But, you know, pedigree race performance confirmation are crucial. It's uh, when buying horses, you know, it's, 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 it's weighing up all of those things and trying to find the value amongst them. And everyone's slightly different. Obviously, we'd all like to buy a brilliant race winner out of a, you know, with a brilliant pedigree, with perfect confirmation, but those horses make huge sums of money. Um, so it's about giving on certain things that you don't mind giving on. For me personally, I would buy a mare with less good confirmation in front because, you know, we have a lot of foals here and I'm, um, you know, would like to think that I'm, I'm good at helping foals um, be correct when they're born and help them with the farrier. So it's something that I'm good at and can add to 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 a, to the offspring of a mare. Um, and if she hasn't got perfect confirmation, her price will be less. And I, you know, you can give a bit of confirmation. I would give a bit of confirmation to buy a bit better pedigree or a bit better physical. So, you know, I don't know what you think, Joe, but it's, it's about weighing those things up. And um, you know. And it's as simple as that, really, and just coming to coming, trying to find trying to find as much value as you can is the crucial thing. Try not to 
try not to follow too many trends. This industry is led by fashionable trends. You know, don't necessarily buy mares that infold the fashionable stallions at the moment because, you know, they're just going to be they're going to be a premium. Maybe look look at something else. But yeah, get advice and and weigh those things up. Brilliant. Now, confirmation is fascinating because you, you see plenty of horses with poor confirmation in the winner's enclosure, but, but mm. the, the, the foal and yearling market is, is pretty unforgiving, isn't it, Tom? On, on oh, it's brutal. It's, it's, actually, it's, it's actually crazy, is the honest truth. I mean, we, and, and we sell, you know, we sell 50 yearlings a year. Um, and it's, it's all because, you know, bloodstock agents and people, the people buying the horses, you, if you buy a horse for an owner and you walk him up and down from two weeks later and say, look at this horse that I bought for you and, and the horse toes one in or doesn't, then people get upset. So it's a slightly sort of um, ridiculous situation. And it has been proven, I think, that uh, it actually makes no difference to race performance, uh, front leg confirmation. So, you know, as breeders, we, you know, we would say that, but... Um, it, it, you know, the yearling sales and the foal sales is very, very unforgiving. Yeah. And then the sort of options as far as whether you buy a maiden mare or a barren mare or an infold mare and age, Tom, do you have thoughts on those subjects? Yeah, I do. Um, again, it, I'm a big believer in buying value. I think uh, maiden mares, buying maiden mares gives you uh, it has pros and cons. The con is that you, the, the downside is you've got to keep keep your mare for two years until you get any return, a foal or whatever. Uh, the upside is that you you're much more in control. You buy the filly, you know what she looks like when she finished racing, probably um, before she's let down into a big big mare. Um, you can choose the stallion you go to you can you can uh, find out and choose to sell her or not sell her or you know you've just got that element of control whereas if you buy a pregnant mare you don't know what you're getting um often people have seen a couple of foals and they're trying to move that mare on or they've you know they bought a maiden mare and they've covered it with something and they're trying to make a bit of profit on it anyway so they tend to be more expensive um older mares I, I've had a lot of luck buying older mares in many ways, with, 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 which have produced good racehorses. Um, and for whatever reason, the owners have, want to move them on, maybe because they've got two fillies in the family or something. Um, and just breeding away with those older mares for two or three years, I find has actually been quite profitable just because they've got the pedigree there, they've produced the racehorses, trainers want to buy out of mares with proven records. Um, so, you know, and often you can see sales prices of, the, of their previous stock. So you just know a bit more information. So, you know, it's all about weighing up what information you know um, and, and uh, going from there. Um, yeah, I think um, age-wise, uh, you know, they do get cheaper. The, old, the, the older they get, even maiden mares, even ma ma fillies that have raced on to five and six um, can be bought at a, a, a better value because obviously they're older. So, um, yeah. Those are my thoughts. I mean, I, I wouldn't go against buying older mares. It just depends on what you want to do. And perhaps fair to say with the older mare, the return is more predictable. Um, yes. But with the younger yeah. mare, you've got the chance of hitting the golden, the, the goose that lays the golden egg. So that, that's yeah. sort of exciting. Exactly. Um, not lots of options for buying. You, you can go to auctions, which I'll mention again in a moment. You can, you can buy privately. Um, there are selling and claiming races, which would make me incredibly nervous. Um, I think I'd like to say that, that important, especially if you're spending quite a lot of money, um, to have a proper pre-sale examination. If it's a filly out of training, making sure she's got the bits she needs to breed. If, if she's an infall mare, making sure she is in full. Um, and a huge advantage if, if you're coming into this without a huge amount of knowledge, um, using professional advice probably a bloodstock agent or, or similar mm, totally agree a blood, bloodstock agents are brilliant um buying privately uh, i would i wouldn't be shy of buying privately but you must have you must have good advice a lot of people do buy privately you can buy good value earlier in the year with fillies that perhaps haven't trained on and had a good race record of two or three and now they're four um and it's may and the, their owners don't breed and um you know, and they don't want to pay training costs for another six months until the sale. So people are up for selling privately, but you must have advice. You must see the horses first. You must get them vetted. 
So always good to use some kind of professional, whether it's a bloodstock agent or not. Um, be aware of the costs that come with bloodstock agents or professionals. They're obviously going to charge a commission, um, but I would always recommend paying it because at the end of the day, they know the people, they know the, they know the horses, they know what they're doing. Um, and normally their commission is less than the value you'd be getting. So I think it's a good idea. Thanks, Tom. Just going back to auctions, the wide variety of auctions, they, they can be purely national hunt or, or purely flat or both. Um, they can be specific in, in the type of horse they're selling. So it might be foals or mares or yearlings, um, or it could be a mixed sale. Um, the best way to find out um, when and where the sales are and, and the sort of returns that the sales offer is to go um, to the, the auctioneers' websites. And, and the main auctioneers um, in uh, England and Ireland are, are Goffs with a, a, a UK and an Irish wing and Tattersalls with a UK and an Irish wing. But we're, we're getting a little bit tight on time. So if we keep moving on, the, the, the next subject on, on the next slide is talking about sort of legal obligations and important to say that um, as owners we have a legal and moral uh, responsibility for the welfare um, of the animals that, that we own. Um, and there is now increasing legislation on registering ownership, um, which is why the 30 day full notification came in. Um, in, in essence, it, it's a legal requirement that um, you, you register your ownership of a horse within 30 days of it being born or, or, or you acquiring it. Um, in addition to, to these, we may be worth considering that, that we have a responsibility to the breed, to the thoroughbred. Um, it's been developed over about 350 years um, into this phenomenal athletic um, animal. Um, and, and hopefully our generation will take responsibility for looking after the, the overall welfare of the breed. Uh, one, one of the things that does create problems is, is producing stock that, that don't have a realistic athletic future, um, which is no help to the horse and, and it's no help to the breeder and it's no help to the industry. So you know, perhaps that's the, the, the key thing is to focus on producing um, horses that, that have, have realistic potential. Tom, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, for me, welfare is, you know, massive. People, people underestimate how, how expensive it is to look after breeding stock. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming more important as well. I think the spotlight's going to be sh sh shone on it. Um, you know, as breeders, we have a, we really do have a moral obligation to look after these lovely animals and we are responsible for the breed, as you say, Joe. And, um, you know, uh, that really does tower above all everything else for me. And, um, you know, if you choose to come into this game, that's, that's got to be number one. So, thank you, Tom. Maybe to have a quick sort of think about the benefits of, of using a boarding stud. And, and certainly I don't want to put off people who want to care for their mares at home. It, it is the most fantastically rewarding and, and in, enjoyable role if, if, if that's what you want. Um, but if there's any doubts about knowledge, it's worth thinking about a boarding stud. And, and also, maybe if 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 you, you're struggling in specific areas and, and covering or foaling or sales preparation are, are obvious examples then then you can do a bit of mix and match you can mm. um use use a boarding stud for, for key areas so the, the main benefits of using a boarding stud is that you get the knowledge of an experience of, of a professional operation um, you, you get the full range of, of facilities. Uh, you may actually find that you get economies of scale. So certainly using foaling as an example, Tom mentioned um, they may have somebody sitting up all night right through the foaling season. And, and that can be justified if you're foaling sort of 40, 50 mares. Um, the, 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 the owner breeder or, or the breeder looking after horses themselves, especially if you've only got one or two mares, foaling can be incredibly expensive and, and, and requires a, a fair degree of knowledge to be done um, to a high standard. So um, 
the, 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 those are what I'd see as the benefits of, of mm. using a boarding stud. Tom, could you talk a little bit about selecting a boarding stud and then add any comments sure. to what I've said as well? Yeah, sure. I think you're t totally right. For me, it is it, it's totally about knowledge. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this this industry is about breeding um, breeding uh, you know for the very best you're breeding for the sales you're breeding for perfection and it is the small things in breeding that make the most difference think you know things like foaling things like confirmation of young foals having someone that really knows what they're looking at and can advise or, or, or have good farriers there to tweak the various things in e-tweaking when the growth plates in a young foal are open and things can be tweaked before you know all these things have time scales so it's just the experience and the knowledge of people is, is absolutely crucial um that's not to say you can't do it at home it's just to say um it's just to say that, that those are the benefits of using a boarding stud for an, you know, using the foals as an example if 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 something is missed and a foal toes in a bit, then you'll, you know, you massively pay the price in sales. So it is economies of scale. And for me, it, it, you know, it's a good thing to do if you haven't got the, the full, the full facilities at home. Um, relationship with the, with the, with the, 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 the way to, I think when you're looking for a boarding stud, the, the key uh, ingredient is to, if you get on well with the person running it, you know, you obviously look at the land, you like the place, there are lots of good boarding studs, there are a few bad ones, you've got to be careful. Cost is very important, location is very important. Some people love visiting their horses every week and come here all the time, and some people I would see once or twice a year. Um, it, it's very, very different. Um, the facilities they have, um, all that kind of stuff, you know, do they have someone sitting up foaling? Do they have cameras? Do they have lunderings do they have individual turnout paddocks for for yearling prep do they have horse walkers so they've got areas where they can walk horses in hand all that kind of stuff comes into it um and you know as as joe said it's economies of scale you know these 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 places aren't cheap to run these facilities aren't cheap to put in and to to get the best results at the sales your horses need the very best care and it's about trying to weigh that up with location cost and the relationship with the person running it so all those things are really important um and you know owning mares can be fun as well if you find someone you really get on with um it can be great fun and you go to the sales and have a good result and it's great and you, you know you follow the progress of these mares and the foals through their lives and it's you know it's a great experience so don't view it just as a cost it's a service um that hopefully benefits everybody and you can have a business relationship with the boarding stud as well as, as things develop. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, know, you know, the other thing is most boarding studs have the top class vets that, you know, it's all set up. That's very important. Um, the best vets are sort of limited to where they can go. So you know, they're limited areas, they only, they only go to so many places. So even even if you sent your mare to foal and then get covered at a boarding stud and then bring her home and, and have her in the field is a good option rather than trying to do it all at home and risking, um, risking issues. Yeah. And, and to me, the, the, the sort of additional responsibilities if you're providing keep yourself, it, it is so important to have a, a good and thorough knowledge of horse care and, and, and have suitable mm. facilities. And, and as you mentioned, Tom, um, vets and farriers are a very important sort of part of the team so you, you, you want to make sure you've got access to, to, to those sort of support facilities as well um yeah and then, you know as you know joe it's, it's 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 picking up on you know with with foals it's picking up on things early you know it's it's all those kind of things that are really important that they're missed um they can have big impacts on a horse's life so it's yeah absolutely no, totally. And, then, and you can't always backtrack. <laughs> right. Um, you can't backtrack, we, no. You certainly can't. <laughs> we, 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 we've used our time, Tom, and it, it, it sort of left for us to, to do a bit of a conclusion. Oh, yeah. it's totally what, Gone quick. What, what I'd like to say is, is I'd like to make people aware of, of the massive benefits of the Thoroughbred Breeders Association. Um, amongst them, they have produced a broodmare ownership guide, which um, goes through some of the points Tom and I have talked about today, but, but also um, 
gives broader information and, and, and signposts to, to, to more information or help, which, which may be very useful to people coming into the industry. But the, the, the TBA do a massive amount. I was lucky enough to serve as a co-opted member for several years, and, and Tom, you're a current member, and, and I don't think people really appreciate what the TBA do in, until they <laughs> sit on the board, probably. But, you know, yeah, they can exactly. offer access to <laughs> professional services. They've got the insurance, which we've mentioned before, um, COVID allowing, they, they run enormous number of events, um, that there's employer guidance, um, training and education is a very big thing for the TBA and, and political industry representation and if it wasn't for the TBA I'm, I, I'm not sure that this year's covering season would have gone ahead just as, as an example. Um, but, but sort of my conclusion is, is you know, please um, do think about becoming a, a, a breeder and, and know that there is support um, available to, to help you as and when you need it. Mm. I totally agree, Joe. I mean, it's it's the, one of the most rewarding things you can do. It's why some of um, you know, the wealthiest people in the world want to do it because, you know, it's so rewarding when you get it right. Um, it's great fun. Um, you can make some money on the way if you make the right decisions. And... You know, I, I think it's a brilliant industry that we should encourage people to, to, to get involved in. Um, and I, as you say, the TBA do an amazing job and they're there to help. And, um, and actually, one thing I've found from starting um, from the bottom in this industry is that people are really willing to help and uh, always ask for advice. And people, you know, the, the, the organisations and the people with the expertise are there to help. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, as you can tell, I'm a big fan of it and would highly recommend it to anyone. Um, so thank you. I think, are we moving on to questions, Joe, or what? Yeah, I think, Mel, Mel you've got some questions lined up for us. I do indeed. Thank you very much to, um, to you both there. Um, we've received, received quite a few questions, so I think we'll have time to um, only answer a few, sadly. But um, I'll direct the first one to you, Tom, if that's okay. Um, sure. there's, is there still room for the small breeder with one or two mares? I, I personally, I strongly believe there is. Um, without going back over everything we, we've been through, the, the key is quality. Uh, I'm not saying you have to own black type mares, but the key is to, to, to have a mare that is worth breeding from, um, that is probably worth paying a boarding stud to look after, worth investing proper nominations into and then there definitely is room for it um the, the the flip side of that is that if you have if you have a bit of land yourself and breed away again it absolutely is but you've got to be breeding from the right horses there's a lot of overproduction in the world of thoroughbreds and um it doesn't help anybody breeding average horses out of average horses so the, the, my advice is that absolutely is but it is all about quality um, at the end of the day we're trying to be the best race horses um, and uh, you know, to make it financially viable, that's 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 what needs to be kept high is the quality. Great, thank you, Tom. Um, so the next question I'll direct to Joe. Um, are we encouraging overproduction? Yeah, Tom's mentioned overproduction. I think the, the, the thing to balance that is is the last time I I got a figure on it. We're, as British breeders, we're only meeting. Um, around about 50% of the demand um, in, in Britain for racehorses. So it's overproduction at the wrong level. Um, and if we can get our production um, aimed at where the demand is, um, then, then overproduction becomes far less significant. We're, we're not overproducing, we're just producing the wrong sort of horse. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, the next question um, I'll direct to you again, Tom. Um, what do you look for in a good broodmare? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question. We are lucky enough to have some of, uh, they don't necessarily live all the time, but they board here during the breeding season, some of the very great mares. Um, one, one, a couple of things that I've noticed over the years of running this stud and seeing some of these, you know, it's quite hard to see these good mares because they're sort of they're wrapped in cotton wool in their, their, their home studs. So, you know, we see a lot of stallions, but we don't see a lot of mares. But I'm fortunate enough to, to I've, no, I've, I've no, obviously it's not, it's not, it's not uh, an exact science, but I've noticed that a lot of the very best mares have, you know, have very wide 
chests, very wide hips, um, good length, good depth of their chests, um, good bone, um, normally have pretty solid temperaments and, you know, just sort of know they're good, just like the good stallions. So uh, it, it does, it's not rocket science. The nice mare's always pretty nice, but for me, good depth of chest, good width and good length are the main things to look for in mares. Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Um, next one I'll direct to Joe. Um, I can't be the only owner breeder to be alarmed by the total dominance of Northern Dancer lines. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's fascinating. Um, right. I think we all know that, that you trace the sire line of any thoroughbred and, and, and you come back to one of three foundation stallions. That There were more foundation stallions, but they no longer um, appear in, in the sire line. Um, and it's definitely true to say that the Northern Dancer has become quite, quite dominant. And, and actually, before very long, um, there's a pretty good chance that we'll lose two of the three lines and everything will be exclusively Dali Arabian. So every Y chromosome will, will come from the Dali Arabian. Um, certainly one of my concerns, and I've been in the industry for, for a horrendously long time, um, has been... Um, the introduction of the large books and I think the worry with the large books is that um, it does have the potential to reduce the genetic pool which is the thoroughbred. Um, certainly interesting to see um, the Americans imposing a, a limit of 140 mares for their books and, and, and I think probably the main reason for doing that is is that they feel that if individual stallions cover massive books it is going to um, accelerate <coughs> Um, the reduction in the gene pool that is the thoroughbred. So I don't actually think it's a particular problem that, that there's a lot of dominance by Northern Dancer and he's become dominant for a reason. Um, but I do think we need to look at, at the sort of holistic picture. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, and then just one final question. Uh, Tom, how, how do you get started in breeding? <laughs> um, so there's not, um, there's not the kind of syndicates that there are in racing, but uh, the best way in, uh, you know, we, we would have a sort of client a year that had bred a nice filly um, and wants to breed from her. You know, that is the best way in owning racehorses um, in these big racing syndicates that then become breeding stocks a good way in. Going to the sales, getting advice, buying, buying in at the right level, teaming up, you know, as we talked about, overproduction is a problem, uh, quality is a problem. So, you know, a good way is to team up with four, five, six, ten friends and pull a larger sum of money together and buy a slightly better filly, mare, whatever, come in at a slightly higher level than you would on your own. Um, those are the best ways. Um, yeah, I don't know what you think, Joe. Have you, have you, uh, you know, there's not the sort of syndicates there are, but I think you kind of have to be proactive yourself and, and sort of make your own syndicates, really, and then, and then have a good relationship with a boarding stud or, or an agent and, and go on from there. No, absolutely. I'm nervous about saying you mustn't go out and buy a cheap mare because there are occasions when, when it works. But of course I think, there are, yeah. You, yeah. you know, we want people to be realistic in their expectations. And, and as you say, Tom, if you've got limited capital, then there is so much sense in, in getting together with, with like-minded friends and, and sharing the, um, the initial capital that, that, that's required and, and, and sharing the joy and the fun, actually, at the end of the day. Mm. Interestingly, it's not so much the, 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 the cheapness of the mare. I bought very good value fillies for very small amounts. It's the, it's the gen, they all cost the same to look after. And it's, it's dealing with the costs afterwards and the nomination fees and the this and the that. That's what's handy to have a group of you doing it. That's kind of what I meant. I mean, I, I strongly encourage buying at any level if you think you're buying value and it's about getting advice about what you're buying. Great, thank so, you. I, oh, sorry. So, sorry, I know, is there any, any more questions or not? Uh, no, um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, but thank you both um, very much. Um, and thank you also to everyone that's joined in to watch this webinar.